All right, well, welcome everyone. I'm so glad that you're here this evening uh, <clears throat> for another one of our Mountain Voices um, hosted by the Museum of the White Mountains. My name is Cynthia Cutting. I'm the director there and very pleased to be presenting tonight's um, speaker. I'm really excited about this connection for the museum. Um, I wanna thank our members who make evenings like this possible. Um, and we are really excited to be having um, these kind of gatherings as we're um, <clears throat> experiencing this digital time um, and finding that it's wonderful, a wonderful moment to learn something new and to meet with other people. And just as we know, just so great to see faces. So um, thank you for being here and bringing us um, a community tonight. So we're really glad. Um, this is a special night for us um, to be uh, presenting this speaker. It's very special to us because of her connection to um, our White Mountains, and she's going to talk a lot about those tonight. So I won't talk about it, but um, for those of you who don't know Ellen Oliver, um, she's a dancer from Massachusetts. She was the 2020 our Artist in Residence for the White Mountain National Forest. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, boy. <clears throat> <clears throat> Yikes. Um, and um, her art also extends to film and visual arts. She is currently interested in the idea of wildness and how people relate to spaces that are considered wild and scenic. I'm so pleased to introduce Ellen. Ellen, take it away. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you for that introduction. Um, and thank you everyone for being here. This is really exciting. I'm seeing a lot of people that I met this summer from my residency and I see some of my students here and my family and that's so great. I'm really excited. So I'm going to share my screen in just a moment. Um, oh. Sorry, Ellen, I'm sorry to interrupt. While you're doing that, I forgot to say, um, if you have questions um, as we go through, as Ellen goes through her talk, please put any questions in the chat. And at the end, um, Rebecca will curate those for us so that we can um, um, have a discussion afterwards. Sorry about that, Ellen. No problem. Um, yeah, so if anyone would prefer to have, I'm going to be talking during my slides. So if you would prefer to read what I'm saying um, on your screen, just let me know or let Cynthia know and I can um, send you a, in a private chat all of the text that I will be speaking. So just let us know. All right, thank you. So here I go, sharing screen. Okay, can everyone see my PowerPoint? Yes, awesome. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so thanks again for being here today. And we'll be talking about my work from this past summer as the 2020 artist in residence at the White Mountain National Forest. During my residency, I created a dance film called Untrammeled by Man. And here is a photo, it's a screenshot from the film. And behind me in this photo is actually a sculpture that was created um, from the 2018 artist in residence, Quinn Morissette. And that sculpture can be found at the Dolly Cop campground in the forest. And before we begin, I just wanna say thank you again to Cynthia Cunning Rebecca Enman for inviting me here tonight. Um, I'm really excited about this. And also for Marianne Leberman from the US Forest Service and also Kate Griffin from the Arts Alliance of Northern New Hampshire for making my experience possible this summer. Okay, so here's a photo of me from this summer. Um, here I'm on Lion's Den, which is on the way down from Mount Washington. A bit about myself, I'm from Blackstone, Massachusetts. I like to consider myself an interdisciplinary dancer. I say interdisciplinary because my interests extend beyond dance to choreography, painting, film, and rock climbing. Um, I just went ice climbing yesterday as well. It was fun. Um, my work is a journey in how these forms and mediums can relate and ultimately broaden my understanding of movement as a form. 
And here are several of my paintings. They are mixed media and acrylic on canvas and wood. They remind me of the shapes and densities that I see when I climb. Um, so a lot of the shapes that I see in the rocks and boulders when I'm going up the cliffs. And my work focuses a lot on the play between movement and shape. I also play with choice making and chance procedures in all of the art make that I create, artwork that I create. <laughs> all right, and so I'm gonna uh, go back a few years to a project that kind of started my interest with working in aluminum foil and then extended to my work from the summer in the forest. And so this here is a screenshot from a film that I created in 2019, and it explores the meeting point of climbing and dance. I was interested in the shapes that climbers make with their bodies as they climb, and the meeting point between the rock and the climber. I looked at how climbers adapt their movements to fit the composition of rock, and so I was thinking a lot about how we can't ask the rock to accommodate our own climbing. A person who climbs really has to learn how to share their weight and trust the rock and also how to become part of something that is thousands of years old. And to me, this is really similar to dancing because dancing, especially with partners, you have to shift your weight, trust your partner, be a part of something bigger than yourself. And these ideas really extended to my experience in the White Mountains and to my experience with recreational sports there. And so my friend Lena actually wrote a poem for this video project. And here's the poem, it reads, The rock and I, we form a duet, organic and mineral. Our silent ephemeral choreography is etched in an instant. It emerges and disappears. Each movement is a sketch of a line drawn nowhere. Fluid and awkward outline bound to be forgotten. So here is another project that I created after that previous film. And so a lot of those curiosities led into this project and sparked my interest with materials and working with aluminum foil with movement. And so this project was a duet in which I shaped yards of aluminum foil on the stage. And I was interested in the imprints that are left over after you touch aluminum foil. And you can't get aluminum foil to look the same once you start to use it. You can't get it to look like it looked once you took it out of the package. And so for me, aluminum is a common household material and I associate it with abundance and convenience. And to take this even further, I started thinking about how when we use the forest and when we're engaged with the forest, how can we touch it without leaving folds and imprints on the forest? And so I don't believe we can really view the forest with convenience and unlimited resources in the way that sometimes people associate common household products such as aluminum foil with. And all this led to my artist residency in the White Mountains. And this here is also a screenshot of me in, in the film that I created. So the White Mountain National Forest and the Arts Alliance of Northern New Hampshire began offering this program to artists in 2011 as part of, as part of the centennial celebration of the Weeks Act. Now the Weeks Act is really important to know about. It was created in 1911 and it allowed for the federal government to purchase and manage forest east of the Mississippi. Before that time, unmanaged logging in New Hampshire caused ma many uh, major forest fires in the Northeast and severely damaged the wildlife and ecology in the White Mountains. Um, it also caused a lot of pollution uh, farther south in Rhode Island and Massachusetts. Um, and so the signing of the Weeks Act really protected the White Mountains in this area. 
And the motto of the forest is here in this photo, it's the land of many uses. And unlike national parks, which are more protected and based on conservation, national forests manage timber, fishing, wildlife, watersheds, and research, as well as recreational sports. So it's really used in so many ways that you can't really use national parks in those ways. And so now the White Mountain National Forest holds over 1,200 miles of non-motorized trails, including one of the oldest hiking trails in the US. And there are nine of these national forests in the US and the White Mountain National Forest is one of 14 forests inside of region nine. And um, we're in, uh, there are three districts inside of the White Mountain National Forest. And during my first uh, week in residency, I mostly stayed inside of the Andro district here that's circled, the Androscoggin. So, I really felt my body physically adapting to the intensity of these hikes. Um, I was hiking, I think like every day that first week, I was just going out there and exploring as much as I could. And there was a really a physical meeting point between me and the mountains. And I really experienced that I, when I had my camera with me, I practiced filming my own body during that journey of hiking. And I like to think of the camera as a moving body in itself when I'm working. I like to consider the camera movement as well as the editing process as a choreography. And so I really enjoy how film can challenge the idea of what dance is. It allows for the audience to consider the movement of trees and also the rhythm of a walk as dance. So it really broadens our idea of what movement can be and what dance is. And this is a video of my first day in the mountains where I was experimenting with the play between movement on the camera and movement on my video or in my own body. <laughs> So each hike required a lot of planning and packing. I would bring multiple water bottles, food, sunglasses, sunscreen, bug spray, hiking shoes, camping equipment, uh, as well as my camera and aluminum foil. So I couldn't help but think about all the actual materials that I needed in order to be in the forest in this way. And I couldn't help but feel like a visitor um, with all of my luggage. A lot of the material also had aluminum foil. Um, my poles, my trekking poles, as well as my uh, frame for my tent and a lot of the climbing equipment uh, has, includes aluminum. So that kind of tied in for me with my research. So here is me. I am standing in front of uh, where I was living this summer. Uh, this is Camp Dodge. And I was really lucky to live here because it was right across the street from one of the designated wilderness areas of the forest. And so that area that's across the street, that wilderness is called the Great Gulf Wilderness. And that ended up being a central part of my project. And Camp Dodge is, it's a really wonderful place. I really enjoyed my time there. And it's just four miles north of Pinkham Notch and uh, the White Mountain, or Mount Washington. Um, and so it's a designated area for um, the Forest Service trail crew, as well as the AMC trail crew to live during the summers as they're working. So I learned a lot about that history this summer. And going back to the idea of wilderness areas, 
um, a wilderness area, such as the Great Gulf Wilderness, which is where I was across the street from uh, Camp Dodge. Uh, wilderness areas are managed very differently than other areas in the forest. Wilderness areas are close to motorized vehicles and equipment, and trail crew working in these areas are restricted in which kind of tools they can use for their trail work. There's also fewer bridges and stricter camping rules in these areas. And so in this photo here, I just want to point out on the right in the green, it says, in wilderness, you are the visitor. And I read that on my first week in the wilderness and it inspired me. And I ended up integrating a lot of these themes in wilderness into my project. And so the Wilderness Act was passed in Congress in 1965. It's separate from the Weeks Act that we talked about earlier. And the Wilderness Act designates the wilderness as an area where Earth and its community of life are untrammeled by man, where man himself is a visitor who does not remain. So my project looks at how we shape areas that are not supposed to show traces of human impact. And some of these wilderness spaces, however, you can still see um, traces of early logging practices. And Marion Leberman, who is a member of the Forest Service, told me about a large suspension bridge that was in the wilderness outside of the Lincoln Woods Trailhead. And of course, a large suspension bridge uh, doesn't make an area feel untrammeled by man because it's man-made. Um, so the bridge, however, also makes it accessible to hikers and it prevents hikers from getting wet in the water and having to cross the stream. So she brought forward a really interesting dilemma that the Forest Service has to consider, which is to what extent do we fix trails and bridges in these wild spaces? And when do we let nature and time take over? And another example of this dilemma is in 2011, a tropical storm destroyed a lot of the trail in that same Lincoln Woods area. And so the Forest Service had to decide whether or not to repair the trail to its former uh, grade, which was flat and very accessible because that um, trail used to be actually a railroad. Um, but when the tropical storm hit it, it really changed the path. And so they had to think and consider, do we let the storm permanently change the trail? And which is more true, which is truer to wilderness? So living alongside trail crew really informed my project. I was able to witness how exhausting and fulfilling trail work is. I was learning about the behind the scenes and the labor that is required to maintain these beautiful places. I felt so much appreciation for the decades of hard work that was put into these trails to protect these spaces and to allow other people to enjoy them. I started questioning who is really enjoying these spaces and I realized how a lot of people don't know what goes on uh, behind the scenes. And a lot of people don't know about how important it is to maintain these trails and to stay on them while you're hiking because we don't want to damage the wildlife and cause more erosion in these spaces. And this is a beautiful staircase at the Glen Ellis Falls that I saw a trail crew uh, repairing. So beautiful. And so I spent a few days shadowing the White Mountain Trail Collective, as well as the Access Fund repairing uh, steps at Cathedral Ledge, which is uh, actually a little bit outside of the National Forest, uh, so it's close to it. But uh, the Cathedral Ledge, those steps, uh, repairing them really allows for climbers to have an easier access to these beautiful climbing walls. And also it protects the plant life. I saw a porcupine when I was out there, uh, so it really protects 
the wildlife from hikers just plowing right through the forest to get to the wall. I also spent time at this photo here at Glen Ellis Trail um, next to the Glen Ellis Falls where trail crew were building also a wheelchair accessible path for the public to see the falls. Part of my project explored the physicality of this labor and the immense strength and engineering that is required to build these paths and staircases because a staircase like this is gonna last a hundred years. I even followed my roommate who is um, working for the Forest Service to the top of Cabot Mountain. And here I was able to witness um, a helicopter drop off for supplies for a cabin on the top of the mountain. And the camera that I was using for my project is a mirrorless 4K Sony. Having this camera also made me feel like a visitor trying to capture these fleeting moments in nature. Again, though, this like so much planning went into this drop off for supplies. So I had a lot of appreciation there. I also worked with a sound artist named Nico Towers based in New York City. And I worked with Nico for the audio of my project and I created field recordings of all of my hikes. I recorded sounds of nature on nature, such as trees in the wind, as well as humans in nature, such as my boots scratching the dirt. I recorded everything from the sound of my camping gear zipping up to the sound of trail crews working, the sounds of tourists on top of Mount Washington. And all of this accumulated and I began developing movement material. I rehearsed each day at Dolly Cop, which is a campground. And I created movement that was a physical response to the way my body was feeling after all of these hikes. And I also made movement as a response to the audio stories that I was collecting. I started filming this movement in different locations. I would hike up to a really tall moment, high moment in the mountain, a high area in the mountains with my heavy backpack. And I'd spend a whole day out there filming myself dancing. I was uh, just surrounded by trees and it made me really think about uh, who the audience was in this project. And the audience suddenly became the trees and the wildlife and um, the environment around me rather than people. And a lot of that time was also spent uh, clapping and making loud noises, trying to scare off bears and being by myself in the woods. And so there is definitely a fun element of filming, performing, and then checking in with reality. Okay, are there any bears around me right now? Uh, and also being exhausted after hiking up. So. There was a lot of physical responses that I was uh, experiencing. And so overall, the project enabled me to reflect on how hiking, climbing, even uh, driving in the forest is a choreography of itself and a physical response to the many layers of maintenance and use. I learned that the older trails in the forest uh, which mostly considered the fastest route up the mountain were designed very differently than the new uh, trails in the forest, which are engineered to really protect it. And there's, there are so many ethics for caring for the land and our uses in the forest come with a responsibility. I even remember uh, crawling on my hands and knees after filming, inspecting the ground to be 110% sure I didn't leave a single crumb of aluminum foil anywhere in the forest. Uh, and so I was really practicing leave no trace ethics. And my hope for my film is that it's a window for visitors to consider these questions on their journey in, into the forest and also to appreciate the work that goes on to, in protecting it. Here's another screenshot from my film. I ended up 
saving every uh, every part of the aluminum foil that I used in the project. I have it still, it's in my closet at home. <laughs> and uh, I also saved all my aluminum from my previous projects. My goal is to create an installation and um, also wearable art with the, with the aluminum to further explore these ideas of imprint and impact in our environment. Uh, I, after my residency, I used some of the leftover aluminum foil for an outdoor performance in Cambridge, Massachusetts, as part of the Amasset Choreography Lab at the Dance Complex. And so I performed this at Starlight Stage at the Teaching Artists and Musicians concert. And the piece is inspired by my project in the White Mountains. The title is actually A Visitor Who Does Not Remain, which is part of the uh, Wilderness Act. So I'm going to show just a minute excerpt of this. A lot of the movement stems from my film as well. It's repurposed. Okay, so here's the point in the presentation where I invite you to take a moment to roll your shoulders, stretch your neck, stand up if you need to, um, take a moment to just feel the way your body's sitting in your chair. And I'm going to play um, just a short excerpt of um, some percussion that my partner uh, made in the forest this summer. Um, we found a lot of trash on Mount Success in Mount Washington, and so we made some percussion, uh, some percussion from it. So here it is. Oops. Hmm. There it is. Okay, so next we're going to watch the film that I made called Untrammeled by Man. Um, we're going to watch it here on Zoom. And if it starts to freeze a lot because of the connection, then what I'm going to do is send everyone a link to the video instead. But we'll, we're going to try it here on Zoom first.
one of the things we've learned over a hundred years of trail work in the White Mountains is at the bottom of our staircases, we need to bury the first step entirely in the ground because after 10, 15, 20 years of hikers and, and walkers going through, the ground underneath the bottom of the staircase will get eroded away and then the staircase will start to slowly fall downhill. But if we bury that first step, that's that contact point where everyone's boots push off and it prevents that erosion. A lot of the trails here are really old and kind of old in their design principles too because they just go straight up the mountain, they just take the shortest route up and it didn't really take into account what a lot of foot traffic would do or what a lot of heavy weather erosion would do to those trails. So they kind of, they need a lot of work to stay usable and um, if they're not really like taken care of, they don't have hard surfaces, people will go off trail, the trail widens, it becomes like it just takes away a lot of the surrounding environment. And, like kill the plant and just creates more and more erosion. A lot of them are on like old logging roads that were built to, you know, clear cut the forest anyways. So it's kind of it's a little conflicting to try and like save these places for people to enjoy when they weren't really built for that in the first place. Um, yeah, we're definitely trying to dig ourselves out of a hole. So out of the Lincoln Woods Trailhead, we have trail on both sides of the river where you could cross at the trailhead and go up the west side and then cross back while you're in the wilderness and come back down and it was a really nice loop trail. And that bridge, which was a, a large suspension bridge, needed maintenance. It needed everything, all the wood redone. And in the end, because it's in the wilderness, we, we were like, really should we have this because the wilderness is not supposed to have signs of man in it and so in the end we made the dis district ranger made a really hard decision that was not made a lot of people unhappy because they lost that nice loose trail and we ended up not replacing that bridge and actually taking it out making the wilderness a little bit more wild again and so if you wanted to get back on that side you now have to ford the river um, one of the things we're struggling with now in that same area, because that wilderness was logged using railroads and trains and stuff, there's some great trail that's railroad grade, so it's a really easy hike out of, right out of, again, out of that trailhead. But in 2011, when Tropical Storm Irene came out and the river went way up, it took a big chunk of the land and part of the trail out on the west side of the river. And we were able to move that section of trail back a little bit to retain that railroad grade flat experience. But since then, we, you know, the river is cutting into that bank and we know that at some point we're gonna lose that bank and lose that railroad grade. And our options are to move the um, trail up on the ridge, which makes it a different type of experience, not one that a lot of families with their strollers could do anymore, that they can do now. We could put a bridge where the um, river is eating that bank away, 
we could do we could do nothing and just not have a trail there anymore. So those are the things that we struggle with right now as we see things changing um, with these big storm events. Is, do we replace it? Do we put it back? What do we do? Um, frankly, to put a bridge there to keep that experience could be a half a million dollars or more. And is that really how we should be spending the taxpayer money? You know, so there's some real hard decisions because there is a really, um, there's a section of the public that wants that experience and they want to be able to do that and they want us to keep it and they will be loud and clear to tell us to keep it. And then there's other people that are like, that's nature, let it go. But as the recreation managers, we need to, you know, weigh all those different options. So thank you for watching that. Uh, before we finish and open up to questions, um, I just want to talk about my next dream that's coming from my experience in the White Mountains this summer, uh, which is creating a film festival called Film Festival of the White Mountains. Um, and so this festival is uh, looking at the intersections of art and science and all the different uses and uh, ecosystems of the White Mountains and the, the way people relate to it and use it. And so uh, hopefully it's going to happen in the late summer or early, or early fall. Uh, still trying to figure out where that's going to be, but it's going to be a film festival with artists uh, including dance films, but also documentaries and other uh, film work centered around the White Mountains, as well as a panel of scientists and researchers in the mountains and um, sculpture artists and performing artists. So it's going to be hopefully two days or two or three days long. And um, my friend Kathy Nicoli uh, gave me this great idea of um, uh, curating it based off of Barry Commoner's four rules of ecology, which are everything is connected to everything else. Everything must go somewhere. Nature knows best. And there's no such thing as free lunch. And I also want to say a huge thank you to the White Mountain Trail Collective and Melanie Lucy for really helping in the planning and organizing of this, as well as uh, Cynthia Cunning and the Museum of the White Mountains and also Robert White and Bob White. Uh, thank you so much for being a part of making this next dream come true. And also uh, thank you to the New England States Touring Grant for bringing Scott McFeeders uh, for a live performance at this festival. So stay tuned. Uh, it'll be happening in a couple of months. And that's it. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. I really appreciate it. And I love sharing all of my research and this work with you. And so I'd love to open it up right now to questions, if anyone has any. Boy, Ellen, that was fantastic. I, the photography um, was really stunning. I, I was really captivated by the, the shadows and the... Um, the 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 shots that that combined your movement with the landscape i was really really mesmerized nice job wow fantastic <laughs>
I had fun. <laughs> yeah, you can tell, right? Right. So uh, amazing to be the artist in residence um, for summer 2020, the summer of all of our dreams or nightmares. Um, so what, what was it like? Was, was there, um, did you feel impact for like who was in the forest with you or how that felt? Definitely. Um, so my idea originally for the, the residency was to have site-specific dance classes um, and also performances um, with dancers interacting with the space around them. Um, but I had to really shift that because especially when I was in the forest, uh, it was just the rules were, were a little stricter and we, uh, it wasn't clear if I could have like outdoor performances, what that would really look like. So I continued with the idea of the film and the aluminum foil took on this other role during COVID for me because it kind of, in some ways represented ways I had to adjust to my realities and kind of fold myself into different uh, new ways of doing this project than I originally planned. And um, yeah, the, the, the theme of uh, adjusting and, and molding really came up for, for me. And yeah, I, I mean, yeah, there was, I think, you know, I could have, it would have been nice to have like more one-on-one -on -one conversations and I think to, to be even more immersed uh, living in the forest. But I think definitely because of COVID, there, everyone was a little bit more spaced out. So that was tricky, but I think I worked around it. <laughs> That's great. I'm so glad you went through it and didn't, uh, and didn't put it off. I'm really glad. Me too. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. All right, well, it looks like we have our first question. Uh, so this is from Quentin and Marcia. Um, they say, we were quite taken with the way you used the log sculpture in your dance and film. Was that originally part of your plan? And where is that sculpture located? Yeah, thank you. So that sculpture is by Quinn Morissette, who was the 2018 artist in residence for the White Mountain National Forest. And that's located uh, kind of towards the back of Dolly Cop Campground, um, which is a very popular campground. Also, I believe it's uh, probably like seven miles north of Mount Washington, north of Pinkham. And it's there, it's, it's there year round. Uh, and he actually used those logs um, I'm trying to remember uh, the logs. His inspiration was also from uh, forest fires that were caused from uh, from logging, and um, so there was a lot of connections in there for me. So, was it originally your plan to use uh, that sculpture in your in your video, or? Uh, it, when I got to the forest uh, in the beginning of August, I, I didn't know that sculpture was there. I think I saw videos of it, um, photos of it on the website for the residency. Uh, and I was really blown away when I first saw it. And uh, Marian Leberman, who is my contact person in the Forest Service, suggested that I go over there and take a look because um, she said that Dolly Cop campground might be a good place for me to rehearse because there's a lot of open grassy fields. So uh, I also uh, found out about it through there. But once I saw it, I was like, oh yes, I, I definitely want to film here. And I, I talked to Quinn also through email about it. Cool. Um, next question. Do you have advice for other artists who might be interested in doing a residency like this? Uh, where the, uh, were there lessons in, that you learned in the field that could help others? Definitely. Um, I guess my advice would be to let go of any expectations that you have. Uh, I definitely had to, you know, scratch a lot of ideas and then shift to different ideas. Um, and I think that kind of allows you to be more immersed in, in the project itself. Um, I think if I really stuck with my original ideas of uh, making outdoor performances, I might not have found that sculpture. I might not have found all these, uh, all this amazing information about wilderness and um, the history 
of the area. And uh, yeah, I guess lessons that I learned in the field. Um, yeah, just staying open and talking to everyone is <laughs> very helpful. <laughs> it was really nice that I, uh, for me to live at uh, Camp Dodge because there were so many members of the Forest Service there uh, that I could talk to about about what they do. Um, I actually have a question. Like, what inspired you to kind of apply for the the residency? Was it what kind of struck you about it? As something you wanted to do? Yeah, I saw the residency a few years ago, but I saw it too late. It was after the deadline. Um, so I had it in the back of my mind for a few years and I put it in my calendar, like this is when I'm going to apply um, for the next year. And um, the White Mountains is a place that I grew up going to a lot with my family. And I, like, I remember being uh, like on top of Mount Washington with my grandfather when I was a kid and just loving it. Uh, and I've been back quite a bit ever since and I've been hiking a lot here. And so it's, it's definitely uh, a place that is close to my heart and I think close to many people's hearts, whether you're a visitor or if you live here and it's a very special place. Awesome. Cool. All right, next question from Hannah. Uh, your dance was beautiful. One of my favorite parts of the dance was on the bridge. Was it difficult to create movement on it? Yes, definitely. A lot of that was also on the bridge was improvisation, but it was quite a challenge uh, because the bridge, it's a suspension bridge. It, it was moving. <laughs> Even when you walk across it, there's quite a bit of movement. And uh, so I, I'd have my camera uh, set up on the edge of it. And, you know, I'd go out with my aluminum foil dressed up in my little shorts and my outfit. And, um, I went out there really early in the morning, hoping that there wouldn't be other people hiking across the bridge because that's the bridge that goes into the great Gulf wilderness. It's the entrance to it. Uh, and so I'd, you know, be rolling up into aluminum foil and then I'd see someone in the distance about to cross the bridge. So I'd have to like stand up with <laughs> this giant ball of aluminum, grab my camera and like shuffle off the bridge. Uh, so it was, it was quite tricky logistically, but in terms of movement wise, I, I think, you know, that's always a fun challenge. Uh, and just also the challenge of being in the movement and not being concerned necessarily about what it looks like on the camera when you're in the moment filming. Uh, and then I also got, because most of the footage I had to do myself with just a tripod or holding the camera. And so there was this one shot, I had the camera up on the bridge, looking down at me in the water and knowing that the bridge moves quite a bit. So that was just fingers crossed that it would be okay. <laughs> yeah. Came out beautifully. Thank All right. You. Question, um, what was your process for creating the choreography we saw in the shots of you dancing? Uh, Alyssa wants to know what you ate for weeks up there in the mountains. <laughs> uh, thank you, Angie. Uh, so the process for creating the movement, um, a lot of it was created, uh, I would hike up different mountains during the day. Sometimes I'd rehearse on the top of them or on my way, uh, just improvising on my way up. And then a lot of the time for many days I was uh, spending uh, like before dinner, after dinner at Dolly Cop Campground um, by the sculpture and kind of piecing together movement ideas that I thought of or different movements that I would feel as I was hiking and kind of translating that into something bigger that inspired um, more like total body movements. And um, some of it was also improvisation uh, and kind of taking scores based off of the sights around me and the sounds around me. Uh, and some of it was created from the video, um, the audio recordings that I had of interviews. So I, I would take rhythms of the, of the words people were saying and translate that. And uh, I would eat, uh, well, uh, uh, Camp Dodge has really great food. So I, I had a lot of food there and um, I, you know, had my usual yogurt in the mornings and, uh, you know, a lot of granola too. 
light foods to pack up to the mountains. Awesome. Um, did you fall into any rituals in your daily hikes? Just like we, we can anticipate certain exercises in the dance class, did you find a new way of preparing your body and mind? From Amanda. Yeah, thank you, Amanda. Um, there's definitely a ritual in the packing and the preparing. And I was thinking a lot about that uh, and almost being obsessive that I don't forget something back in my cabin. Um, and I, at the same time, a big ritual in terms of unpacking when I finally got to a place that I'd want to film, uh, like taking out all of the items, making sure I don't leave anything, going back, checking the ground, looking for aluminum foil. So that felt like a ritual in that sense. Um, but I think in terms of hiking, uh, pure ex exhaustion and my breath and the, um, I guess, repeated, the, the repetition of just steps was a, a ritual for me. All right. Don't have any yet. Uh, let's see, how much footage did you, did you film? Was it hard to decide what to keep and what not to keep? Oh yes, I had many, many hours of footage. <laughs> uh, so it took a long time. I, I didn't finish the, the editing until I think a month after I left the forest um, because there was just so much footage. And uh, yeah, it, it just, I guess it was a lot of, I played a lot with chance too um, and picking random footages and see how they kind of work next to each other. Um, so playing with chance in the editing and, um, but at the same time, trying to also stay true to a few themes that I had going on in my mind as throughout the project, I guess. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, sure, another one from Amanda. Can you talk about how it felt to be alone? Yeah, definitely. That was um, something I thought about a lot. Uh, my first few experiences going up uh, hiking, um, I, I was excited. Um, I, I've done a few hikes, I think, by myself before that, uh, like small ones, I think. Uh, but I, you know, I went up into the Great Gulf on my first day and uh, really could feel how I was alone out there. And uh, that solitude was a big impact. Um, but I also, I did feel like nervous quite a bit too in the filming in this one location where it was a campground and there was a lot of, I didn't read these signs at first, but after filming a couple hours, I read them and it said that this campground is known to have a lot of bears at it because of you know people leaving food, leaving traces left over. And so then my whole face went like, <gasps> And I was really nervous from then on. And I just remember I'd, I'd be dancing. I had my film camera out in front of me. And then I'd like look around because I heard something in the woods. And then I'd start clapping and making ridicu ridiculous noises just to be loud to make sure there wasn't a bear. So I did. And then I did see bears on my hike down and my heart was just pounding. So that was another physical uh, experience I had. Uh, but at the same time, I felt like that aloneness could keep me really uh, immersed in the project and, and in the thoughts as well. It was such a blessing to have a whole month to do this work and not be, uh, you know, juggling teaching and performing and driving to all these other jobs at the same time. I could just focus on this. So it was a blessing. I'm glad you talked about the amount of time because I think that it is such a special opportunity for any artists out there to have a residency time where you are focused in on your work, you're living your work, you're moving, moving, and you're physically moving through it. But for all artists to really um, 
engage in your work and reflect on it and really and you know immerse yourself in it rather than having all the distractions around you i think it's a real special experience that ours can have yeah. thank you and yeah. it is it's very special and i hope that this program can um spark in, in new ways in the future yeah yeah it's great well, thank you so much, Ellen. This has been a wonderful presentation. Great job, really artistically done. You're just, and you speak so well and so such interesting concepts. I really, really enjoyed it. I learned a lot um, and really enjoyed your film. I'm looking forward to the film festival. Please let us know um, and uh, be great to um, get the word out to all of these um, people and more. So thank you so much. And thank you all for coming this evening. Um, enjoyed having you here in, in our group. Um, and uh, please come back for more Mountain Voices and definitely follow Ellen and her film festival. Um, thank you, Ellen. Have a great night, everybody. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for coming. <laughs> <laughs>